this picture is a measure of tension in the interbank market. And what it does is it says that if the Bear Stearns crisis had occurred on the 1st of July 2011, then Lehman would have occurred sometime in early 2012. And the reason for this peculiar dating is that I started following the distress around July 1st. And this is where the actual stress was going in, in the period from July 2011. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you follow this simple linear projection, you would have had Lehman a little earlier than early part of 2012. And at this point, in the Fed facility, uh, for having the liquidity swaps uh, with the ECB. And this gave some respite, but not quite. And then came the famous LTRO. And then we had this very dramatic change. So I call this slide the crisis averted because these two facilities, in retrospect, clearly made the difference between a, a, a very severe crisis and something that is a crisis but not severe. And if you, it, this, this a picture is a similar picture, in, in some ways even more frightening. This is the measure of liquidity shortage, of dollar liquidity shortage in, uh, in the European area. And this says that well before uh, the, uh, the end of 2011, dollar liquidity pressures were almost at Lehman levels. So the LTRO and the associated facilities were clearly very important. And the point I want to make is that while a lot of focus has occurred on sovereigns, on the buying of sovereign debt, the principal, uh, uh, the principal uh, achievement was to allow the banks to function. At the end of 2011, the bank debt maturing in uh, the euro area was about 600 billion euro, and the two LTRO facilities in net terms provided about 500 odd billion. Of that, only about 115 was used for sovereign debt, and the rest was used to refinance debt that was coming due, and if that debt had not been refinanced, the banks would have capsized. So, since Marcus might want to cut me off, let me give you my, my bottom line, that when you think of the Eurozone crisis, it is very tempting to think of it as a sovereign crisis. But the proposition I'd like you to think about is, that at the heart of the European crisis lie a set of very weak banks. They are weak <coughs> banks and they are very deeply interconnected. So if you have an interconnected node of small weak banks, then the system itself becomes weak. And the European system is in part highly linked, but at the core are nodes that are weak. And moreover, they are now in the midst of a macroeconomic process of extraordinary capital reversals in Europe. So they are, they are themselves weak, they are interconnected, and they are mediating a reversal of capital flows, which is putting additional pressure on them. And the rest of what I'm going to say is just to show you a few pictures to show you that these assertions are reasonable. So this is a metric of the uh, leverage and funding of uh, banks in the three areas. On the y-axis is a measure of equity to assets. It is saying that European banks before the crisis had relatively low equity to assets and they had 
relatively high reliance on what is called wholesale funding. So from both perspectives, they were vulnerable. And during the course of the crisis, the UK banks and the US banks made some progress in reversing those, uh, those uh, vulnerabilities. And European banks also moved in the same direction, but to a much, less, a much more limited extent. So at the end of 2010, European banks continue to remain vulnerable. I didn't get all the numbers for 2011, but they do show that European banks continue to have low equity to asset ratios. At, at the current level, they are just above where the US was at the start of the crisis. And the reliance on wholesale funding continues to be severe. So this is the proposition that banks are weak. <coughs> If you look at the composition of the wholesale funding, European banks rely to a large degree on dollar funding. Unusual in the sense that other countries rely, the US banks rely uh, a lot on dollar funding and the UK banks are more international. But this is long-term debt. If I had a similar picture on short-term debt, the picture would look even more serious the euro area banks rely hugely on short term debt, uh, dollar funded short term debt. And as we know, the money markets had completely closed down uh, in terms of short term debts. This is a measure of uh, a somewhat refined measure of bank interconnection in Europe. Uh, what it is saying is that banks in good times uh, before the crisis were becoming somewhat less interconnected. But then the moment the crisis started, <coughs> two interesting things happened. First, there was a, a jump up in the interconnection. It's basically what this is saying is that the forecast error variance of Euro European bank spreads are explained <coughs> to a considerable degree by innovations in the spreads of, other, uh, of uh, other European banks. So what this is saying is that that kept going up, but more importantly, the peaks are going up. And it's the peaks that are important. What they're saying is that at the time of stress, whenever there is stress, the banks become like one giant bank rather than being a number of individual banks. So when the Spanish spreads uh, started going up, Towards the end, that, that number is again beginning to take tick up. And through this period, as su successive waves of stress have occurred, we have had a successively higher uh, uh, interconnection. We have a similar story on the sovereign linkages. So this is the share of sovereign uh, <coughs> assets held by European banks. And again, before the crisis, it was, it was large, but it was coming down. And after the crisis, that number <coughs> has crept up, in part because of uh, facilities like the LTRO towards the end. But, but certainly, even before that, this sovereign mm -hmm. bank interconnection that we all worry about was actually going up during the crisis rather than going down. And you have a similar picture for a number of non-Euro uh, Euro area nations. And what you see is that they were <coughs> always a little less, but the tendency during the crisis for them to also creep up is there. And that's a common tendency in a period of crisis. You will rely on, on sovereign assets. But clearly, the European banks are, are more interconnected in that respect. So this is the basic story that banks are weak, they are interconnected deeply amongst each other, especially in moments of crisis, and they rely to a great extent on sovereigns whose own credit is over time becoming less, uh, uh, is becoming less valuable. I come in the end again to a topic that has been discussed a lot this morning, but I want to give you a slightly different perspective on that. And that is this 
famous target balances. You see that the targets were balanced roughly at the start of the crisis. There's a lot of imbalance, which you've seen. But look at what is happening in Germany. So Germany is had large current account surpluses. That's the dark black line. And those surpluses were going up. But in large measure, German surpluses were being financed by German private exporters and German banks. So when Germans exported to the rest of the world, Germans financed their own exports to the rest of the world. And that stopped. That stopped at the start of the crisis. At the start of the crisis, German uh, exporters continued to export, but German banks and exporters said, we are not going to finance these exports. And that's the yellow part. That's the target balances. Once German exporters stopped financing their own exports, the target balance had to come in. The other country that I worked on intensively during this crisis was Ireland. And I show you this picture from Ireland. These are the capital flows from Ireland, into Ireland, but from Germany. And what they're saying is that during the run-up to the crisis, there were large capital inflows from Germany into Ireland. And the moment the crisis started, those capital flows reversed. A positive line means that capital was being brought back to Germany. And the interesting thing about this is that, yeah, so that line says that there were some very large flows, but even if you discount them, there was a capital reversal. Look at this interesting line. The current account deficit, vis-a-vis -vis Germany, was always tiny and stayed steady. So Germans were not doing a lot of trading with Ireland, but were sending a lot of money in. And when the crisis struck, they wanted to pull all that money out. So if you, if you, if you will, the so-called financial market integration that occurred in Europe was a period of irresponsible lending. And if I was not an IMF official, I would use stronger words. <laughs> I, I, and then once the crisis started, that was a, there was a reversal. And the point of this is a simple one. And this is my sort of last point. That if this reversal had not been financed by the target imbalances, three consequences would have followed. One is that there would have been large defaults in Europe because these banks, these, these monies due to German banks and to other counterparties in Europe would not have been repaid or would have been repaid in, in, in small amounts. Second, there would have been a massive current account uh, reversal in Europe of an order of magnitude that occurred in Latvia or thereabouts rather than the most modest current account uh, changes that occurred. And if you put the two together and the slide that Paul Krugman showed yesterday where he compared the current downturn with the downturn in the depression, he would have shown the depression in Europe to be significantly larger as a consequence of the defaults and the current account reversals that occurred. So the target balances, whatever the, the claims over here, have served a, an important purpose <clears throat> of maintaining a degree of stability within the Europe, a stability that was made necessary because of the excesses of the past. So because of the excesses of the past, a certain amount of allowance had to be made. That does not mean that this does not have to be corrected. I'll skip this chart. The great Peter Kennan said in 2000 that the treatment of imbalances within the target may be the most important piece of unfinished business for the ECB. So there were, there were 10, 12 years ago, these target balances and their correction was a recognized uh, shortcoming of the, of the process in, in Europe. Nevertheless, today, a more gradual adjustment process has to be mediated 
but this is not purely a technical matter. And my policy recommendations are basically along the same lines as others have said. All I would add and emphasize is that bank resolution has been talked about a lot in Europe. And bank resolution has to occur in Europe. Deleveraging is no longer a matter of individual banks reducing, increasing their capital. It is a matter of closing down a number of big banks and merging them to form a smaller and more stable system. Very good. Okay.